Okay. Good morning, everybody. My name is Dario. I run research at the Wikimedia Foundation, and I'd uh, like to welcome you to this brown bag talk about uh, citations in Wikipedia. I'm thrilled to have uh, an extraordinary guest today, Jeff Builder from Crossref. Uh, he's director of strategic initiatives at Crossref. Uh, for those of you who don't know what Crossref is, I'm sure that Jeff's going to give you plenty of uh, uh, context on this, but if you see like this meaningless sequences of characters to click on when you want to access a product paper, you can blame this guy. Um, so we're going to talk uh, about uh, uh, the interface between Wikimedia and, uh, and, and Crossref uh, and talk about uh, citations, citation metadata. Uh, we're going to have two presentations. So a bit of logistics. Uh, uh, there's a live stream you can follow on YouTube. And for uh, live conversation, you can join the IRC channel Wikimedia office where Abby will be moderating. So two presentations, and we're going to have a discussion at the end of the day. And with that, I'll give you Jeff Builder. Uh, OK, thanks. Um, so uh, I should probably start a little bit about explaining uh, something about that, uh, those weird character sets um, uh, that Harry mentioned, and also probably a little bit about myself. Um, uh, uh, as Dario mentioned, I'm the director of strategic initiatives at Crossref, and um, that's really a grand news way of saying I do the new stuff. Um, so I'm kind of the R and D director there. Um, and a bunch of the things that have come out of Crossref, some of which you might be familiar with, um, some of them are things like uh, Crosscheck, which is a plagiarism check system that's heavily in the scholarly uh, uh, publishing industry, uh, FundRef. Fund for identifiers, which are used heavily for trying to identify research that's uh, funded uh, by, by, you know, that's uh, that comes under certain funding branches, and uh, and the thing that you uh, may be seeing a lot more of is Orchid, which actually also came out Crossref in my group, and then spun out as a separate organization. So these are the kinds of things that we work on. Um, largely, I think if you were to uh, characterize uh, stuff that we work on, uh, it's infrastructure, scholarly infrastructure. And ideally, uh, one of the things that uh, is characteristic of infrastructure is that, uh, is that it looks like this, right? That is that um, when it's working, uh, you don't notice it. It's only when it breaks uh, that you actually notice it. It's only when things are incompatible, incompatible uh, that you notice it. So uh, DOIs, to the degree that you don't notice them, uh, consider that success. Having said that, that leaves us with a kind of difficult uh, situation, which is that we often have to explain a little bit about what they do, because uh, it's not immediately obvious what they do. So some background with Crossref, we're a 5,000 member uh, membership organization. We're a nonprofit, um, and um, we're generally, uh, our members are scholarly publishers, but we actually define publishers with a small p. Uh, that is, uh, it's not necessary that they be professional publishers, you've got lots of members who, for instance, have publishing operations, uh, but don't consider themselves to be publishers. So places like the World Bank, the OECD, uh, uh, you know, uh, the International Monetary Fund, things like that. Um, we're, we don't discriminate on business models, uh, we support all contents types, all disciplines, um, and uh, we also have a lot of uh, library affiliates and, and things like that join Crossref as well. And um, what we do, and our major claim to fame, was this DOI uh, thing. DOI stands for Digital Object Identifier. Um, it's the identifier that's digital. It's not necessarily the object that needs to be um, digital. That's being object that's being identified. And these things, as Dario mentioned, are kind of weird opaque string, but they have a, a particular function in scholarly communication, and and it's this. Um, in the late 1990s, early 2000s when publishers were putting content online, scholarly publishers were putting content online, uh, they realized uh, immediately that, of course, one of the most useful things that researchers could do would be to um, be able to click on references where the reference was available online and be taken automatically to that reference. Um, it seems obvious, but there were some logistical problems uh, actually doing, that, not the least of which is that um, there are thousands of publishers and you had to have some sort of idea of what the URL structure was going to be on the publisher's sites. And then, of course, if the publishers changed that URL structure or did anything weird, uh, a lot of those links would break. And, um, and you know, 
and, and this is actually, you know, the, the, the major problem Crossref is trying to address. Um, and it may seem like an easy thing to do. I mean, after all, one thing that you could do is tell publishers to stop breaking things, right? Just update your URLs when uh, you modify your websites. And that works for a class of uh, broken links, and actually probably for the vast majority of broken links. Um, but, um, but that only addresses one issue of what happens when links typically bro break. That is, um, when, a, when a, an organization is too lazy, you know, they go and they change the structure of their website, they still control the domain, but they don't create redirects to the, uh, to the old uh, URLs. That's by far the most common source of broken links. Uh, but there's another source of broken links that's a lot harder to deal with, and that's when uh, this part of the URL changes. That is when an organization renames itself or splits into two or merges or does something like that, um, then uh, you might not have control of the URLs anymore. And so you need some mechanism in which that can actually um, support things still even when these situations occur. And you might think that these situations are uncommon and you might think that they're particularly uncommon for you know, publishers and government organizations, the kinds of uh, entities that participate in Crossref. But there are a lot of reasons that these things can change. It's not just that things get sold, it's you know, creation, transfer, poverty, forgetfulness. And increasingly, as you see people using URIs uh, as personal identifiers, sometimes that things like force and death uh, means that you no longer control uh, the domain that they thought you controlled at one point. And as I say, there are a lot of reasons that things break. And if you just go and, you know, a lot of people think, oh, well, university links aren't going to break. Time. Uh, government links aren't going to break. Actually, government links have the um, highest rate of link rot of almost any kind of organization, which is kind of not surprising if you think about it for a little bit, because if the government comes in, what they want to do is sort of obliterate the, uh, the, uh, the history of the old government, so they rearrange all the websites, and they don't really have an interest in people to think. Um, you know, that countries change names. Uh, you know, all of, all of these things happen. And that's when the domain name might actually change. So these are the things that we're trying to address. Um, and particularly, we're trying to address them, well, one reason, of course, is because links are important. They're votes, just like they are on the web. But more importantly, in the case of uh, scholarly articles, they represent the, the evidence record, the scholarly citation, right? These are, if, if this goes away, you can no longer see the evidence for the claims that are made in scholarly articles. And um, in addition to that, might not know who was making those claims. So this is uh, really important, particularly in the case of, uh, of, of research. Um, so we really had to deal with it. Now, the mechanism that DOIs use is not fancy. It's not a technically uh, difficult uh, problem to solve. It's a more socially difficult problem to solve. But what DOIs do is they give, this, give you this, um, they work very much like a card catalog, right? If you go to a library, a physical library, in the old days, you would go, and um, if you looked in the card catalog, they would not tell you, the card catalog would not tell you a book was you know, on the third floor on the fifth shelf from the back. Uh, it would give you a, a call number. And then the call numbers would be mapped to physical locations. And that meant that if they rearranged the library or reshelved books, they didn't have to um, update the card catalog. They could just change the mapping of the, of, the, of the call numbers. And DOIs work exactly the same way. That horrible, opaque string that Mario mentioned earlier um, is, in fact, a URL that is a pointer. It goes and it says, OK, where physically does this URL exist now? So if a publisher changes their website, or if they get acquired, or if they change a domain name, or, or something like that, all they have to do is update those pointers, and all the old links using the DOIs will continue to work. So this allows us to persist links, um, you know, um, and, and this is an important term, persist. We don't claim that they're going to be permanent. Persist is sort of a synonym more for stubbornness. We say they're stubborn links. We will, you know, do our best to update them. We will contact our members. We will do things like find them and turn off their ability to deposit if they don't, if they don't update their links. But by and large, they do because, of course, this is a great source of traffic for them. It's a, it, and, and, and they take this stuff seriously. They take uh, scholarly references seriously. So that's the way that the system works. As I said, the technology is an important. It's a simple redirect. Almost every URL shortener 
on Earth uses similar technology. Uh, but the thing is that they don't actually have an, an organization behind it, and they don't have a membership model that, um, that requires the members to actually adhere to certain conventions and to actually um, behave in a certain way. So the, the technology is very similar, but the organization is very important. And again, this organization, you know, uh, mediates this problem of having to do multiple bilateral agreements between what really are thousands of publishers. You know, a lot of people, when they're thinking about scholarly publishers, if, to the degree that they know them at all, think of the big ones, Elsevier, Spruger, Nature, and so on and so forth. Um, and of course, there are members, but if you actually look at our membership list, uh, it's now approaching uh, 6,000 members, and that's an awful lot of people trying to track them, and so this, this central linking switchboard really helps. So what does this have to do with the Wikipedia? All right, well, um, years ago, when I first joined Crossref, one of the things I was interested in doing was understanding a little bit about how um, non-scholarly content was making use of scholarly literature. So, the, you know, blogs um, linking to scholarly literature, uh, were social networks linking to the scholarly and uh, at the time, one of the things that I looked at, this was about back in 2007, was I looked at, uh, at Wikipedia. And I downloaded a dump of Wikipedia at the time and analyzed it to see how many POIs uh, seemed to be being referenced, and also to look at references themselves to see if they might, even if they didn't have POIs, whether they looked like they were scholarly. And at the time, the answer was there were a few, but there were a lot. Um, and so I sort of promised that I'd come back to the problem later on uh, because it also looked like uh, that, that things were changing and things were growing. And we did come back to that, um, to the problem. Uh, a colleague, uh, uh, somebody who works in my group, uh, we went and we took the referral logs uh, for the DOI system, that is the, the things that show us every time somebody clicks on a DOI and where it redirects to. Um, and we looked at those referral logs to analyze who was driving traffic uh, to, the, to, to, to our member sites. And, um, and we were interested broadly in just understanding particularly how traffic was being driven from non-publisher sites, because we have a pretty good idea of how much the publishers themselves drive. Um, and uh, when we did that, we were really, really surprised, because we learned that Wikipedia is the fifth largest referrer of DOIs to the scholarly literature in the world. Now, um, I usually use weasel words around this because the actual referrer logs are a little bit hard to interpret. There's some, a lot of noise in them, but I'm pretty confident that this is the case now after having looked at the logs again. And I'm actually, you know, I think that the potential here is actually an understatement because uh, the other thing that we've done, and I know Dario's done this as well, is we've looked at Wikipedia articles to determine, A, how many DOIs there are in the references and how many of those DOIs, how many are linked. And not all DOIs that are in the references are linked. And then secondly, not all references to the scholarly literature use DOIs. And that's largely because they're sort of a, you know, a, something that you only know about if you're in the trade. And you wouldn't necessarily know if you weren't a, a researcher that you should add a DOI. And even if you were a researcher, you might not know how to look up the DOI and that you should link it with it. So we think that there's probably a big, there are probably a lot more references to the scholarly literature, um, probably, and, and, and even the traffic suggests. So what this translates to is that uh, back in 2013, when we first, when we last analyzed this data, I tried to get a, a, a refresh of the data to present today, but we, uh, it's still being processed, so I don't have the numbers. But back then, it was about 20 to 30,000 uh, referrals a day. It was increasing by about 2,000 uh, referrals a day, uh, a day during the eight-month period that we analyzed. And the top 10 subdomains that we saw coming in were naturally the English Wikipedia, but then also uh, a lot of traffic from some of the other uh, local language Wikipedias. So this really made it clear that we wanted to engage more closely uh, with the Wikipedia and to see what we could do to, A, understand the, the, the you know, the traffic that was coming from there, and B, also see if we could actually help uh, the, uh, the editors and, uh, of Wikipedia articles to link persistently to the scholarly literature. And so um, I had run across Daniel Meachin, some of you might know, a number of times at a number of conferences, 
And uh, I, we had been talking about this uh, for a long time, and he suggested that we put together sort of a, a little group of uh, what he, I think he termed the media ambassadors because uh, they weren't comedians in residence quite. Uh, they were people who were interested in scholarly literature. Uh, back in, in London at Wikimania 2014, we first met and talked about some of the things that we might be able to do. Uh, the initial group was, uh, was um, Daniel uh, at Senate, uh, Max, Simillion Klein, and Berth Howard. Um, but then a uh, few of them got distracted by other things, and ultimately, um, last year, uh, we got together with uh, Maximilian Klein and Anthony DeFranco uh, to work out on a, a, a project specifically to take advantage of something that had just been uh, launched by, uh, on the Wikipedia, which is a live stream of edits, um, and to see what we could actually do with that stream. And, um, and so we worked with them, and they prototyped a system that they called Cositis, that looked at this stream and tried to pull out uh, DOIs. And, um, and a few, uh, uh, I think a few months later, sometime in March, we announced that we, were, uh, that we had a live Wikipedia uh, stream of Wikipedia edits showing things like, uh, in um, near real time, whenever anybody cited or critically uh, unsighted a DOI in, uh, in, in, in any of the Wikipedia uh, So if you go right now, I hope it's, <laughs> it's live, to wikipedia.labs.crossref.org, um, you'll see this basically this live update of uh, Wikipedia edits and particularly uh, articles um, that are citing the scholarly literature and, uh, as I said, sometimes unciting as well. And this has been a really useful exercise for us because it's really got our members and scholarly publishers interested uh, in traffic that's being driven to them from outside the scholarly literature. It's really highlighted this as a source of a lot of interest. Um, and so they've really been encouraging us to actually further explore what we can do um, to uh, A, uh, encourage people to link uh, using persistent identifiers, and B, um, to, for us to, 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 to monitor this and, and help you know, uh, build tools that, that um, that help people not just use DOIs, but use other kinds of persistent identifiers like PMIDs and PORCs and, and stuff like that. Um, and, um, and most recently, just this week, um, uh, again, uh, Joe, Joe Wass, who works for me in Oxford in the UK, um, uh, decided that he was going to take advantage of the fact that the Raspberry Pi Zero had come out. And um, he went out and he managed to snag one of the last ones before they sold out. And, uh, and at the beginning of the week, he posted this little experiment that he conducted where he put together a Raspberry Pi, a basically a real-time uh, framed uh, Raspberry Pi Zero that's showing us uh, how many DOI citation events or uncitation events are occurring. And so now we proudly have this uh, on our wall in our office at Oxford next to, uh, next to the refrigerator. So if that doesn't show you how important we think this stuff is, um, Nothing, nothing well. Um, and uh, I, I'll just note that the other thing, the thing that is hanging below here is a collection of telephone adapters that I put together in the old days when I used to travel a lot and I used to have to carry all of those things around with me all the time. If there's a better illustration of the benefits of standards, I don't know what it is. Um, but uh, that's also hanging uh, up in our office. So, um, ultimately, I think, again, this gets back to an, uh, an overall goal that we have um, at Crossref, which is to understand how non-scholarly sources are engaging in scholarly literature. We think that this is important for us to monitor. Increasingly, it's important for researchers to know this, for funders to know this, for publishers to know this, to know that research, the formally published research, is having some sort of an effect that is being accessed and used by civilians out there, not just uh, scholars. And so ultimately, our goal is to feed this into a project that we'll be launching um, in the middle of next year called the DOI Event Tracker, which is a general purpose framework where we want to gather information about the usage of DOIs in all sorts of different sources, whether it's Wikipedia or Twitter or blog posts or uh, social networking sites, so that we can um, build a pool of data that can be used for, amongst other things, building awareness applications, uh, perhaps building metrics, and so on and so forth. And again, we see this as a, a thing that we're uniquely positioned to do because we can basically create 
a mechanism for collecting information for the, you know, our 5,000 members from however many different social media um, you know, uh, uh, platforms uh, or other platforms that might be engaging uh, with literature. So we're building this tool that goes out and collects data and, and, um, and stores it and makes it open. And, and this is really critical um, as, you know, as we collect this information, we want to make sure that people can maximally use it. Um, we uh, don't want to compete with the organizations that are doing sort of professional stuff here, the, the general category of organizations that are building alt metrics, that are doing value add services, reports, um, analyses, and things like that. But we, what we want to do is make sure that these things don't turn into the equivalent of the Thomson Reuters of our day. That is, that Thomson Reuters is a big organization. Well, there are two big organizations that basically. Uh, are the only organizations that have an overall view of traditional citations in the literature. And I'm sure Dario is going to talk about that uh, in his talk. But um, we want to make sure that if we're collecting new sources of information about usage, that that data is uh, open, uh, comparable, uh, auditable, and portable. That is, we want to make sure that this raw data uh, belongs to the community and that everybody can, uh, that everybody can make use of it. Um, so the next things that we're going to be working on and uh, that we're looking at working on, and part of our goal here visiting Dario is to actually see whether we can uh, collaborate on some of these things. Uh, we're interested in uh, further analysis of the referrals by subject category. We have a strong suspicion uh, that there's an, that the DOI referrals that we're seeing, that is people clicking on DOIs and following the literature, occur in specific subject categories, possibly biomedical literature and stuff like that. Um, we want to also start searching for uh, directly linked references. Those people who, for instance, linked something on a publisher site but didn't use the DOI and put the publisher URL to the article in there and see if we can map that back to the DOI and collect that kind of information. Um, and search for unlinked uh, scholarly references. Um, and not just to articles, but to monographs and to what we call the sort of orthogonal related literature, things like patents and, um, and standards and other things that are, that are sort of closely tied to the scholarly literature and often interact with them. Um, we're very interested in, uh, in working with people to improve uh, citation tools that are built, being built for, for uh, Wikimedia and for the Wikipedia platform. So for instance, um, there's a lot of interest in collecting some of this information and making sure that references are pulled out of Wikidata. And uh, we're happy to feed. Um, you know, wiki data so that they've got those references so that you don't, you know, so that not every reference is an individual string. Uh, we think that uh, by doing this, you probably will get a lot of benefits. For instance, um, uh, by uh, using some of the Crossref metadata, you'll be able to do things like uh, flag references that point to open access literature, uh, flag references to literature that perhaps has been updated, that is, for instance, corrected or, uh, or in extremis retracted or withdrawn. Um, so we think that there are all sorts of kinds of tools that can be built off of this that will make uh, the reference and citation process in uh, Wikipedia uh, sort of more, more useful and, and more dynamic. I, 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 as I said, strongly suspect I will talk about some of those uh, projects um, in his talk. So basically that really is um, what we've been doing with Wikipedia. I think it's an overall a uh, uh, project of ours to look at how things interact with scholarly literature. Wikipedia is by far the largest source of, uh, of, of referrals and, and uh, contact with the scholarly literature that we've seen. I say it's like ranked right under the top sort of aggregation platforms like Scopus and, and, and Web of Science, things like that. Um, if you're interested in tracking the stuff that we do uh, further, uh, you can look at our blog.crossref.org or labs.crossref.org where we post all of our experiments and talk about them. And of course, you can contact us directly. Joe Wass is the person who's been working most directly uh, on a lot of this kind of stuff. He's the person who's built that, that tool. But also, a lot of it depends on um, uh, the other guy in my team, Carl Ward, who's the API that, uh, that uh, Dario and others are planning on using to mine some of these references and put them into Wikipedia. And of course, uh, you can contact me if you're interested in any of this stuff. Sure. Uh, I'll be working, uh, will be working pretty closely with Dark. So, anyway, that's it. I think I actually hit.
Fantastic. Thanks, Jeff. This is the best possible introduction to my talk I could have thought of. Um, Brendan, can you help me switch to the, uh, um, the Google Docs? What we're doing this, um, I want to say thanks. That um, Jeff covered one issue uh, that is really critical in terms of the disappearance of links, link rot. Huge, huge issue if you want this network of references to remain persistent and available. I'm going to cover another aspect uh, of um, uh, issues that we have with links and sourcing. This is going to be the main focus of, uh, uh, of my talk today. OK, looks like it's working. Yep. All right, so um, briefly, who I am, what I do. i director of research uh, at the Wikimedia Foundation. Today, I'm not going to talk about what my team is doing. I'm talking about something I'm passionate about and something I've been like collaborating um, uh, with for uh, for a while. Um, so I'm really interested uh, in uh, the question of how we use uh, open knowledge and collaborative created reference materials like those that you'll find on Wikipedia as the entry point uh, towards the scholarly literature, right? Um, and uh, Cameron Nealon is the one who came out with this brilliant uh, wording of Wikipedia as the front matter of all research. Uh, he hosted this great workshop at Wikimania in 2014, uh, a few years before the Chronicle of Higher Education called Wikipedia um, the highest layer uh, without formal vetting uh, that represents the ideal bridge between the validated and the unvalidated web. And I found this like a pretty strong um, uh, metaphor for what Wikipedia represents. Um, so typically, when people start talking about uh, access to scientific knowledge, the audience expects like a rant about paywalls, about how broken the publishing model is. And today, instead, I want to talk about technology. Um, and so you hear me talk about uh, um, unique identifiers. You hear me talk about structured data. You hear me talk about uh, bibliographic metadata and Wikidata. And you hear me talk about GOATs. And the reason why I want to talk about GOATs today is that I want to give you an example of what I like to call the uh, disappearance of provenance. Um, I think it's, it's, it's the main topic uh, I want to talk about and uh, uh, ways we have to uh, counter this general tendency that we see today on the web. So my goal today is threefold. Um, I want to try and persuade you that uh, algorithms used by search engines uh, are undermining linking and sourcing. Uh, otherwise, uh, two of the fundamental tenets of the open web, and ultimately Wikipedia, which builds itself on the notion of sourcing and verifiability. I want to try and persuade you, persuade you that Wikidata is a solution to this problem. And finally, I want to introduce you to a little-known pro uh, project uh, led by the community called uh, um, Wiki Project Source Metadata on Wikidata, which is actively trying to address this issue. So back to GOATS. Um, as I'm sure you all know, uh, Wikipedia has an amazingly well-resourced article about GOATS, uh, their anatomy, their diet, their evolutionary history, their presence in fiction and pop culture. Uh, with dozens of references um, and up to 135 languages. So we really have plenty of very well-resourced information about goats uh, on Wikipedia. And somewhere in the middle of the English Wikipedia article, you will find a very inconspicuous sentence um, about uh, the um, average lifespan of a goat uh, with footnotes and references um, that you can look up uh, to verify that statement. Now, this is what a popular search engine gives you when you search for the average GOAT lifespan, 15 to 18 years, period. Now, let's take a look at this. Uh, this information seems to have been extracted from Wikipedia, or at least from the source that is cited by Wikipedia, but it's presented with no provenance information whatsoever. And you can try this exercise with plenty of statements, uh, you know, uh, that you can think of, uh, they can have like a quick answer of this kind. And this is not an accident. This is uh, something that search engines are heavily investing into. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard of the Google Knowledge Vault. Quick show of hands. Yes, a bunch of you. OK. So um, 
The Knowledge Vault is one of the most ambitious projects uh, Google is currently uh, working on in terms of like uh, 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 going beyond uh, uh, Freebase as its semantic engine. And the idea is that Google can currently crunch its vast catalog of, uh, uh, of uh, documents uh, in its index uh, and generate what they call confident facts. And confident facts are basically triples, like statements like the ones that we, we just saw. Um, they are extracted from all the sources, and they are given a, a given level of confidence uh, as a function of how many sources back these statements. So in other words, uh, references are just used as signal to determine the confidence that Google has in the truth of these statements. Uh, they're not necessarily represented as the output of the algorithm, right? They're, they're instrumental to generating these statements. And, and I think this is a trouble that we need to be uh, aware of and direction that raises some, some interesting questions. Um, obviously, Google is not doing this for fun. This is basically the, uh, the dream of the uh, linked data vision, right? Uh, where you can have uh, quick answers that you, that you can generate just by looking up a pool of connected facts. Um, and with most people shifting to mobile, this need for quick answers is becoming even more pressing. So this is an example of what you see when you ask Siri, how long do greyhounds live? You get an answer, in this case, it's from Wolfram Alpha, but it's pretty much the same story, right? The answer is about 11 years, no source whatsoever. And interestingly, if you go and check what Wolfram Alpha is doing, uh, they have a big disclaimer, and they tell you that you shouldn't really expect to pinpoint any single source for that statement. They really warn you that is not what you should be doing. Um, and the reason is the same. So they have a bunch of, uh, uh, of sources they're using. They want you to trust the answer engine, right, as the authority for that statement. Provenance-free information, that's what users are looking for. They only care about the actual statement, not the source backing it. Um, so David Weinberger made a fantastic and compelling point uh, back in 2012 uh, when he basically called out uh, the, the despicable behavior of these websites that are linking to themselves as opposed to linking to external sources. And he called these sites uh, a stopping point uh, in the ecology of information. Um, and he basically argued that by taking the links out uh, uh, of content, uh, these websites are, are turning themselves into uh, the authority uh, for this information, right? As opposed to allowing people to verify this knowledge claims in the original context. And in a recent conversation with him, he actually reminded me that there's a, there's a war for this, and there's a beautiful precedent in history uh, for this notion of provenance-free information, and that's the almanac. Right? So the Almanac is basically the best example of uh, an answer engine that doesn't give you any, any context about the source. And humanity in 2015 is recreating the Almanac thanks to algorithms, which is an amazing achievement uh, uh, of, our, uh, of our civilization. So we do have a project that is an answer engine that doesn't quite work like an Almanac, um, and that acts as a provenance preserving uh, answer engine, and that's Wikipedia, right? So um, Wikipedia is all about uh, verifiability, it's not about truth, it's about providing access to reliable sources, um, and its reputation does come from the fact that uh, you can look up and verify by yourself this information. That's what makes Wikipedia such an outstanding public service. That's why Wikipedia is not an authority in itself. It's an entry point uh, towards uh, authoritative sources. And you might think that we're doing a good job, given this is basically our official uh, mission. Um, but things are far from being perfect. What you see here is the breakdown of uh, um, statements we have on Wikidata as a function of uh, the source that they have. And up to 80% of these statements, as of uh, last month, um, are either using Wikipedia as their main source or have uh, no source whatsoever. So only roughly 20% of total statements in, in Wikidata do have a source that is an external source uh, that is transparently represented as a, um, as a uh, back in that statement. This is giant tech data on the quality of data that uh, Wikidata is generating. So how do we start tackling this problem? 
Um, and I think we have an outstanding opportunity at Wikimedia to uh, address this issue by building a human annotated uh, collaborative repository of all citation and source data uh, and try and bridge the gap between information we present on our projects uh, and the sources that back it. So in a perfect world um, where all information can be represented uh, as a connected pool of uh, statements, metadata about the sources and sources themselves should be part of this database, right? There's no reason why uh, this should not be part of a, of a database. And um, there have been like countless efforts uh, to try and build a, a comprehensive repository of uh, open bibliographic data. Um, and uh, Crossref represents uh, probably the most uh, accomplished effort uh, in, in that direction. Uh, but Crossref only represents some of this data. Uh, it makes uh, only some of this data publicly available um, to, uh, to, to the general public. Um, and Crossref data, for example, is not integrated into knowledge base. Uh, it's very hard to go from a bibliographic reference um, and maybe the author information to the topic uh, of, uh, of that reference or to the institutions to some extent. Uh, uh, basically, uh, cross-surf data is a fantastic but insular source of information about, uh, about sources. How do we connect this to uh, the knowledge bases that we're so good at uh, uh, building here at Wikimedia? So within Wikimedia itself, um, there have been at least 10 years of attempts that I'm aware of at building uh, a knowledge, uh, um, sorry, a repository of bibliographic information for all the citations that we have in Wikipedia. These efforts go back to 2005. None succeeded. They predate largely Wikidata. Um, but finally, we're here. So finally, we have Wikidata, and I think we have a project that has a uh, the vision, the, the technology, um, the community who is geeking out about uh, metadata and, and structured data, um, the ability to operate at scale, the right licensing model, because we're talking about uh, mostly CC0 non-copyrightable information, um, and finally, and importantly, the independence, because we want to have a service that is not uh, a spin-off of a publisher, but it's a central repository that is not subject to commercial interest by third parties. Um, and so basically, we have uh, all the conditions today. Uh, Wikidata is all, all we need to start building this human curated repository of uh, all citations, starting from citations using Wikipedia. And this sum of all human citations could then feed into um, a large ecosystem of uh, um, consumer services, um, internal integration, Wikipedia, and Commons. Uh, Jeff mentioned altmetric services before that are measuring the impact of citations. Um, and also, we have, of course, uh, all of the providers are of scholarly metadata and identifiers. So how do we start building this? Uh, well, it turns out there's a group of people in the uh, librarian and, uh, and scholarly and Wikimedia community, including myself, who got together and started figuring out uh, how to build this thing. Um, so meet wiki project source metadata that you can look up uh, uh, on Wikidata. So the first goal of these people was to try and determine a data model for storing um, source metadata in Wikidata as items. Um, the idea is, what are the properties that we need to represent uh, the core set of information we want to store for any given citation, like journal article properties, journal properties, book properties, author-related properties, and so on. And I think we did a pretty good job. We have now a solid um, schema that has been discussed and, and vetted. And we start having, in Wikidata itself, um, plenty of publications are already stored uh, using this schema. So this is an example of a, um, a journal article published in uh, PLOS ONE, one of the journals by the Public Library of Science. This is the title, you can see the license, um, the language in which it's written, the authors, publication date, and main subject, and even a picture of what uh, this, uh, this paper is about. So all of this is possible today, and we already have uh, quite a few um, publications uh, in Wikidata already using the schema. Um, but 
what are the actual benefits of this approach? At the end of the day, you could say, you know, we have all these references in, in, in Wikipedia already, and they're structured to some extent. Uh, this is what a template uh, looks like uh, in, in um, English Wikipedia, um, site journal template. Now, the trouble with this approach is that uh, right now, all of these citations are buried in the body of an article. There's no way you can interact with them as uh, items in a database, right? You need to parse content. It's a huge pain to try and make any sense of this. Um, and so people still, if they want to cite something, they need to add a reference to the actual article. How if we could instead cite by reference, as you can do in most reference managers today, how if we could pull the reference from a database like Wikidata and cite it by referring to the, uh, the item that exists in Wikidata and generate the appropriate uh, um, reference string. So this is possible today on many wikis by using uh, these templates that allow you to pull uh, information from Wikidata. It's gonna be one of the first, uh, first benefits of using Wikidata as a source uh, for this data. Um, this is going to be a bit of a, a geeky technical uh, <laughs> slide, um, but it's, a, it's one that I, that I feel strongly about. So uh, Wikidata can also be the place for storing all the mappings of identifiers. Um, and uh, if you've never heard of an identifier mapping or authority control, you can safely skip the slide. But uh, if you have, um, and if played with something like a Magnus a mix and match uh, tool, for example, so this tool that allows you to um, cross-reference Wikidata items uh, with external catalogs, you realize how important it is to have a, a place where you can represent uh, the fact that uh, a given scholarly article that is identified on Wikidata via its own QID is the same as uh, an article that is a DOI PubMed ID, et cetera, et cetera. And the same for authors. So authority control via ORCID, via VEAF, via Google Scholar ID, and you name it. So Wikidata can become the place that holds all the mappings that describe the same, uh, the same objects. Uh, there's also this growing interest that Jeff mentioned in measuring the, uh, the impact of citations beyond uh, scholarly citations. Um, so, this is an example of a popular service called altmetric.com. And what they're doing is similar to what uh, uh, the DOI tracker, event tracker, uh, is doing. So they're basically monitoring usage of scholarly citations in Wikipedia, mostly to give credit to authors, uh, to funding bodies, uh, to show, hey, your work is actually being cited, not just in journals, but also in the most popular uh, encyclopedia online that people are, are, are reading on a, on a daily basis. So to me, possibly the, the, the most interesting implication of this project is the ability to cross-reference uh, sources, as I said, with the vast body of knowledge that we have in Wikidata. So again, uh, if you're using a cross reference API, you'll be able to know something about this specific DOI and the direct uh, uh, metadata associated with it. By caching this data in Wikidata and cross-referencing this data with all the other structured data we have in Wikidata, you can start going from a paper to its main subject, from the subject, in this case, to the taxon that is referenced in that paper, uh, from the paper to the author, from the author to the affiliation, from the affiliation to the location, and, and you name it, right? So this is basically the rabbit hole applied to structured data. And so the next two slides are a bit of a moonshot. So this is something that is not within the scope of what we're considering uh, is going to happen uh, anytime soon. But um, once you have uh, source metadata in Wikidata, you can also start thinking about annotating the, annotating the source in themselves, right? And so Jeff mentioned licenses, like knowing whether um, a specific paper is open license or not is something that got quite a lot of attention recently. That's something the Crossroad API can provide, but you could imagine, imagine of adding other types of uh, um, properties to, um, to these papers. So for example, retraction, um, you can start representing links between, between uh, different sources, for example, A citing B. You can even go as far as representing the semantic type uh, of these relations, right? Uh, there's a a proposal for um, what is called um, citation ontology that has been uh, 
discussed for a couple of years. And you could imagine that given Wikidata allows you to design arbitrary relations, you could imagine properties allow you to describe uh, that the source A extends the source B, or that uh, source A is using uh, methods or data or whatever already using B, uh, or even express disagreement and conflicts between sources. So stuff that, as of today, is really, really hard to extract uh, just by looking at the citation graph uh, of the literature. Uh, and finally, once we have all of this data stored in Wikidata and easily uh, queryable and, and, and analyzable, you can start answering some of these questions, which unfortunately today are virtually impossible to answer at the push of a button. Um, give me all the publications in pharmacology from the 90s that have been retracted. Uh, give me all the facts that we have on, on Wikidata that are backed by works of physicists who graduated at the given universities in the 80s. Um, give me all statements that are supported by articles published in the New York Times, et cetera, et cetera. So all this like work that is really fundamental for uh, the validation of, of this knowledge as a function of sources will suddenly become possible if we have all this data queryable in Wikidata. So uh, I'm going to close here um, and say that in sum, we have the, uh, the ability of start building um, an answer engine that is not an almanac, an answer, gen an answer engine that is a preserving provenance. And we can do this by using existing technology, basically Wikipedia and the properties and data models that we already have uh, on, uh, on Wikidata. The next steps. Um, we're talking to a bunch of people to run a pilot to try and populate uh, Wikidata or potentially a sandbox version of it. Um, uh, James Hare set up uh, an instance similar to Wikidata called Library Base that we can use for testing and some proxy purposes to try and see if we can get a community to uh, um, import and, and curate this data. We need to start designing strategies for automatically importing uh, some of these data from, for example, the Crosser API and linking them to the corresponding statements. We need to understand how we need to refine the, the data model if we need to represent properties. Some properties are not the correct ones. Uh, there's a big, big issue of entity disambiguation. Once you start having all these authors called John Smith uh, with a multiple, um, multiple IDs, the question becomes how you disambiguate them. And finally, most importantly, how can you design a system that allows you to ingest this data while preserving the human curation la layer? It's probably the biggest challenge, right? Uh, it's easy to import uh, all this data automatically. I think the 70 million DOIs you guys have uh, will be relatively easy to ingest. Uh, it's not an impossible task to ingest into Wikidata. The question is, how do we do this in a way that preserves the human curation layer? And with that, I conclude here. Thanks for your attention, and I'd be happy to take any, any questions. Uh, Jeff, you can join me here. Uh, and we have a uh, relaying questions from IRC. It is. <coughs> Look it up on Google. Mm -hmm. nope. Hey, Dario. Yes. Uh, this is Jake. Is this? I, I might have missed. Is this questions time? It is. Hi, Jake. Um, great presentation, both of you. Awesome stuff. Um, I'm curious, obviously the vision here is to capture all citations ever, but our kind of shorter term or more proximate issue is just capturing all the citations that are on Wikipedia. I was wondering if you could talk about the relationship between those two stages. Yeah, that's a great question. And the short answer is, uh, I don't know how this is gonna play out. Uh, what I know is that we want to start small. Uh, like I said, we cannot just start thinking of ingesting uh, all this data. Again, 70 million statements is not an impossible size comparing uh, to what we could store in Wikidata. Uh, but that probably wouldn't be desirable. So I think the first step is going to be after we sandbox and test the data model. Like I said, focus on one community. We have people in the chemistry and um, and biology, uh, you know, genetics community very interested in, in, in exploring uh, this idea of a pilot um, and basically start from there. 
Uh, and yes, the, I guess the first uh, ambitious goal is to have uh, all citations from Wikimedia projects stored in, in, in Wikidata. And then the next step is going to be to put uh, Scopus and Web of Science out of business. But it's going to take a bit longer time. Um, if there's not anyone else asking questions, I might. Absolutely. Um, so Alex Stenson uh, and the Wikipedia library team, one of the things that kind of brought us into this conversation is looking at um, how libraries make recommendations to researchers doing work um, in their libraries and using their databases. And what we have with Wikipedia is hand curated citations that are kind of grouped by topic areas based on how categories and wiki projects work um, on Wikipedia. So we, we can kind of tell like if a X journal shows up in you know, 10, uh, a certain percentage of these 10,000 articles in this topic, um, this might be a journal to start your research on X type of novel, right? Or uh, X type of biography or whatever history. So I, I think the human curated element of this is really fascinating to me because we could take the human curated citations from Wikipedia and make really robust kind of research uh, build into the library infrastructure. So I'd like you to hear you talk about a little bit more about that relationship between like making recommendations for researchers and the human bit that's so powerful with Wikipedia. Jeff, any thoughts on this? Um, sorry. So, um, I mean, I, I see if this. Uh, so, there was something that I was going to say, and 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 that is that um, one of the reasons that I'm actually interested also in getting a better that I think we're interested in getting a better picture of uh, where um, where there are lots of scholarly references and where there aren't is because um, I think I have a suspicion, particularly um, that um, that the references. Uh, if we're getting lots of references being followed from certain articles, that there may be that it may be the case that a lot of Wikipedia articles are serving uh, a purpose that was one that has traditionally been performed by uh, what but what are called review articles, um, and I've got the feeling that um, that the Wikipedia might actually uh, st is starting to become an entry point for people who are doing uh, research in this, and uh, it sounds to me like that's kind of related to what you're talking about, um, you know. And if you could, in fact, flag those articles and say, hey, actually, these seem to be really good entry points for certain topics and so on and so forth, um, and also, uh, you know, I think that that might be quite quite useful um, as far as recommendations go. Yeah, the other thought that I had was uh, related to the uh, maintenance of uh, so like quality of uh, of this data. Um, I know in some cases we have uh, uh, author names that are uh, you know misrepresented, and I guess one of the uh, assets we have uh, in Wikidata or in Wikimedia in general is that when we cache this information, we can also revision control it. So we, if if a human notices uh, you know, an incorrect uh, spelling of an author name, uh, or in some cases, uh, their actual titles that are not correctly represented, or there, there's a mismatch between, I guess, the official record uh, uh, on the publisher site uh, and Crossref. Uh, I guess one way of uh, thinking of the human duration layer would be also to uh, address that issue uh, of potential errors uh, in, in data. Right, and I mean, uh, Crossref has, has been interested in this area a, a lot too, because one of the things that we find um, with things like ORCID and Crossref and uh, things like Archive and 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 even um, uh, PMC is that uh, none of them are set up so that other people can make assertions or corrections about the metadata easily, um, and. Um, and in our view, we would like to encourage, uh, and this is part of what we're looking at with the DOI event tracking system, is to allow people to put information in there about DOIs that maybe haven't hasn't been put in by the by the by the publisher. So, for instance, if a funder knows that a certain DOI uh, uh, identifying an article that that article was uh, uh, was about something that had been funded by them, they might want to be able to make that assertion. Or if the researcher uh, does that, uh, they might want to be able to make that assertion. Um, 
we, uh, as far as versions go, we actually think that collecting all of those statements together might be useful, um, even if they contradict each other. If they, of course, if they don't contradict each other, that gives you a bit more sense that it might be actually correct, the statement. Uh, but if they do contradict each other, that's also useful information to know. So um, we're, we're interested in sort of storing these assertions or claims as we state them um, so that people can harvest them and see claims from different parties about the same identifiers. And it's actually a great point. Uh, like, uh, the idea of having some of this data representing Wikidata means that we also have talk pages, right? Mm -hmm. So you now have an entry point that is collaboratively editable where you can have a discussion about a specific source. It's centralized uh, uh, and it's uh, open license and not. So uh, that's a better way of saying what you would just refer to. I have a question from IRC. Um, one is uh, 70 million plus probably an average of three authors. So 200 million items is a rough estimate. Is that affirmative? No. Yeah, so uh, yeah, w it, when we talked about uh, you know the, uh, an estimate of uh, how many items and statements would have to be created on Wikidata, uh, if you start thinking of the item itself, the authors, the affiliation, the journal, uh, we're talking about something around that order of magnitude. Um, so again, it's not unthinkable given the, uh, uh, the current size of Wikidata, but they would be by far larger than the current uh, size of Wikidata. So that's not something we like, consider at this stage. Right, I mean, the 70, the 70 odd million, and I think it's 77 million, um, Crossref has 77, D, uh, 77 million DOIs assigned to research objects, uh, the vast majority of which are articles. Um, and uh, so we have bibliographic and non-bibliographic uh, information for that. Uh, the thing that, um, in your case, that you have to be considering is, of course, uh, the number of relationships between those 77 million items, and that's going to be many hundreds of, th hundreds of millions of, of, of relationships. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and that's not to mention the relationships between those formally, those things that have formal references and the things that don't, right? Because there's an awful lot of data and other stuff out there that hasn't traditionally been included in, uh, in scholarly references that, of course, I think both of us are interested in seeing um, referred to more uh, robustly. But scalability, thankfully, is not a giant issue at Wikimedia, so we'll solve that problem once we get there. So um, I have a little question which, in fact, deviates a little bit from uh, the referral conversation uh, in, in, in an out Wikipedia. Um, so traditionally, the DOI documents or, or uh, gives numbers to uh, publications, actual publications, uh, scholarly publications. But as publishing moves from the traditional format into more an online publication, including actually Wikipedia, Commons, uh, we still have a lot of uh, and, and news, news articles that we use on Wikipedia articles. What's the future plan for uh, the DOI to start including more of those online publications, stabilize uh, and, and eliminate the role of URLs? Um, right, so the, the, the DOI, I mean, um, the DOI is just a, a, you know, this is a point that I keep making. Traditionally, the Crossref DOI has been used for identifying scholarly articles. Um, and particularly for citing scholarly articles, and that's an important thing to note, right? Because um, as an identifier, it works at a different level than, for instance, maybe an identifier would if it were being used as a serial number or as a supply chain management identifier. Let me give you an example, right? Um, the EPUB, PDF, and HTML versions of an article are intellectually equivalent, right? You don't want different identifiers for them for the purposes of citation. Um, but you might want different identifiers for them if you were, for instance, trying to measure how many uh, you know, uh, units you were selling of each format or something like that. So, um, so particularly in the case of DOIs, we're using them for, for, for referring to intellectually distinct objects. And that poses some interesting problems uh, with, and, it, it, and a lot of people say, well, there's a whole new category of research objects that are different because they're more dynamic, because they're changing all the time, Wikipedia being a classic example of, of, of content where it's you know, in flux effectively, except that you still kind of need this ability to be able to re refer to a particular um, in, you know, version of it. 
um, the expectation that you have of a citation is slightly different than the expectation that most people have of a link. People are perfectly content to have a link to something and, 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 you know, and, and expect that thing perhaps to change over time. But if you have a citation, you want to see what the author saw when they cited it maybe 50, 100 years ago, right? So you will have some different behaviors there. So I hope that I'm getting to your question, which is that we don't see a fundamental problem with using DOIs with other kinds of research objects, things like data sets, media, uh, highly versioned and dynamic content, and this is a place that we're evolving the DOI to right now, and we're working very closely with our sort of sister organization, Datasite, uh, who in particular is trying to figure out how to, is, is adapting the system to work better with uh, dynamic data sets and so on and so forth. Uh, but the thing we're always keeping in mind is that, of course, the goal both of Datasite and of Crossref is to preserve this notion of we're citing something and we want somebody who has cited something, whether it's a data set or media or an article or some new kind of communication, you know, the expectation is that they will see uh, what the author saw uh, or as close to what the author saw as possible. That's a really important uh, thing to keep in mind. Does that? Yeah, I have a question for you. Um, how about using Wikidata queries to identify unsighted or poorly cited statements like statements that aren't well cited currently in Wiki, uh, Wikipedia itself? The question is uh, how easy it is today uh, to identify statements that are poorly referenced uh, or sourced in Wikipedia. I understand the question. Um, yeah, the answer is that it's very hard because uh, Wikidata stores a tiny fraction of statements uh, that we have in Wikipedia. Um, so. Wikidata stores, uh, on the one hand, statements that just don't exist in Wikipedia uh, anywhere, but it also stores, uh, I guess, a, a subset uh, of, uh, of uh, statements we have uh, in Wikipedia, and uh, it's, it's very hard to find uh, via Wikidata possible statements we have uh, in Wikipedia that would need sources. Um, what I know is we have, uh, we have other data sets, like Wikipedia, for example, that can be used uh, to identify potential gaps uh, uh, looking at DBpedia, Wikipedia itself, uh, Wikidata, external knowledge bases, we can try and more easily identify gaps, maybe direct attention of this effort where, uh, where it's needed in terms of uh, uh, sourcing effort. I have another question for Marcia, sure. one in the room. Um, uh, can you confirm about Wikipedia being used as an entry point, at least among teachers and university folks I know? Oh, he can confirm. This person can confirm. They, uh, the quick they quickly glance at Wiki and look for papers and go on to dig for more related paper. Maybe that wasn't a question, sorry. <laughs> it was a statement, I suppose. I mean, I, I, one of the things I'm interested in doing and that we really haven't done but um, would be to see if there are sort of like particularly um, you know, sort of um, particular articles that send an awful lot of traffic or a disproportionate amount of traffic in there, and we just haven't we haven't done that yet. So, um, looking at uh, particular you know fields, um, we have a very rough approximation of uh, how to categorize the, the the journals that DOIs are in. You know, whether they're biomedical, humanities, social sciences, things like that, um, and uh, and then beyond that, also knowing specifically if there are some you know sort of super articles that are sending a lot of uh, references that would be interesting. And that also reminds me that we have a project in the pipeline uh, to segment uh, readers as a function of how they consume Wikipedia. So uh, I'm thinking that one, some of the data we were going to get uh, from that segmentation effort, uh, looking at uh, whether people are looking for a quick look up of a fact uh, for an overview of the topic or for in depth information on the topic, might also help us uh, identify articles that belong to different types. Uh, in terms of information of uh, who, who's reading them. And this probably is a good time to bring up. Um, we're very aware, and Dario in particular has been working with us, uh, very aware of the sort of uh, the creepy factor of potentially invading people's privacy here. And, um, and this is actually a big concern that's, being, that's developing in, in, our, um, in the scholarly communication space period, which is um, we've gone, you know, libraries have been really, really careful about preserving the privacy of their patrons. 
uh, in, in meat space. And they haven't really kind of done the same thing in the digital space, but they're beginning to realize they haven't done that. And they're beginning to get uh, you know, uh, justifiably worried about it. So one of the things that we hit when we were working on this project with Wikipedia was, of course, when you switch to HTTPS, uh, all of a sudden, all your traffic went dark, right? Um, and, um, and so we worked uh, very closely to try and figure out what, um, first of all, to make sure that our systems uh, supported HTTPS, and then also to figure out how we could, in fact, still get some information without personally identifying information, and so on and so forth, so that we could actually continue to uh, see how much traffic was being driven from the Wikipedia. So this is a big, big issue. So yeah, you know, we sit there, we go, oh, we want to know all these things about like the users and stuff like that, and that actually makes people very nervous as well. So. Um, I just wanted to, uh, as a vocal of the IRC, say in the peanut gallery there, there. I mean, thank you very much for the Excellent. presentation. All right. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. I think this is a wrap. Um, see you on the internet.